This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area. Marcia Kavanaugh, thanks so much for joining us. Well, among those things to be thankful for on this weekend after Thanksgiving are the leftovers in the refrigerator. For news, however, the heat is still on, including the status of the up and coming River District Development Project, a look at some of the ongoing investigative stories, questions about what went wrong with the Faubourg Brewery, and an analysis of the now complete statewide elections. For dessert, there are stories from the past year for which we can be thankful. At our table are tonight's Informed Sources, Errol Aboard, producer of Informed Sources, David Hammer, investigative reporter, WWL Louisiana, Channel 4, and Tony McCauley, reporter of the Times-Picayune, the New Orleans Advocate. We go over to E first because finally the elections for this year wrapped up. Yeah, uh, a few points. Uh, a lot of times after elections, people look at the, at, at the results and the turnout and they say, oh, no, what's wrong with our democracy? I mean, look how low the turnout was. In this case, statewide, it was 22 percent in the runoff, and in the New Orleans area, 15 percent. Admittedly, that's pretty low. But there are reasons. It was a boring election. I mean, it was a boring election from the very beginning. It was a boring election from the time that Jeff Landry locked up the Republican Party nomination. Everybody pretty much knew he was going to be the winner. And then when he won in the primary, it made it even more boring because he didn't have a governor's race. If he got into a runoff, if it had been a contested runoff, if there had been this issue out there that one person was on this side and the other person on that side, it would have brought people out. If it had been something that scared people, like the David Duke, Edwin Edwards uh, election, then, then people would have turned out. And so sometimes, I mean, all the time, it's the election itself that shapes it, you know. And so I have no doubt that under the right circumstances in the future, you know, we'll get a high turnout. The causes of the high turnout may, may not be something that they would like to have. You know, sometimes it's better to have a, a boring election because people maybe just be more content. And so, anyway, I wouldn't draw too much for that. The thing about the uh, Republican sweep, though, for the governor and, and all the statewide offices, uh, it's pretty impressive. I, I think that John Bell Edwards may be the last Democratic governor, at least for a long time, uh, because if you look, everybody else who's in the position to run for governor. Uh, mainly the people who have state, you know, the attorney general, the secretary of state, uh, uh, state treasurer, uh, the, the, the high-ranking members of the legislature, they're, they're all Republicans. Uh, so those are going to be the people who are, who are in the news. And so I don't see any circumstance, unless it's really amazing personality develops, uh, we don't see. But I, I think we're in, a, we're in a, a long time for a Republican rule. That doesn't mean that the party in power is going to ignore those who are part of the party that's not in power because it's good politics for them to reach out to other people. And so sometimes uh, it's better to be on the other side. And then uh, it's like New Orleans always, candidates for New Orleans always lost for governor. You know, the state always didn't want to vote for somebody for Louisiana. But when that person was elected, who might have been from North Louisiana, uh, like John McKith and the, or, 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 or Buddy Roman, they reached out to New Orleans. So, so, so sometimes it's, it's not a bad thing. But the um, um, race is always a factor, in, in, you know, in talking about politics. The, the racial black, um, uh, breakdown among voters is about 60 percent white, 30 percent black, and then and 10 percent Hispanic or whatever, or whatever is left. And that kind of uh, certainly um, affects the party registration, too. We do, you know, have some winners, if you want to mention their names. Yeah. Well, well Nancy Landry, the um, uh, Secretary of State, and so we have two Landrys among, uh, in high office. Uh, Liz Murrell, who's elected to the uh, Attorney General, I think she's a, a rising star. I think somebody uh, we're going to be hearing about more about in the future. And John Fleming, who was a former um, congressman from Northeast Louisiana, uh, was elected treasurer. All of these, the percentages they won with were like around 65 percent. They almost all got the same exact vote. And which is that, that Republican vote? Uh, mm -hmm. It was um, one big block, and of course the uh, uh, the Republicans have the majority in, in, in the legislature too, and, and a super majority. I mean, that's yes, the yes, other the thing yeah, that yeah. you see here because the trend is just continuing to go in that direction. And with Miro coming in as the former deputy under uh -huh. Landry in the attorney general's office, yeah. then you kind of have this very unified government that we haven't 
had, especially with yeah. a Democratic governor and a yeah. Republican-controlled legislature. Yeah. In terms of the party registration, you'd think with this kind of sweep that the majority of voters were um, uh, Republicans. But actually, it's close. 39 percent of Democrats uh, and 34 percent of Republicans. So Democrats have a, a slight majority. But I think the Republicans are more of chronic voters. I mean, they're the kind of people who are going to go out there no matter what. And so it's almost 50-50 right now, but, but the uh, Republican vote. We're also seeing the growth of the suburban vote, too, mm -hmm. which, of course, tends to be a Republican vote. Okay. Well, it'll be interesting to see what Louisiana politics, how it develops, and what legislation and what government, how that's going to develop with this solidly Republican now presence in our statewide government and in the right. legislature, too. Right. All right, Eve. Thanks a lot. All right, Tony, we're going to go over to you first. And <clears throat> uh, River Center. The development. Um, why don't you tell us, you know, what exactly that is, where it's supposed to go, and how is it progressing? Sure. So next week um, is the first dirt that's going to fly on this project, uh, which is covering 50 acres right next to the convention center down by the river. It goes back over 20 years ago. They bought this land with the idea initially that they were going to expand the convention center. You know, convention centers are key to uh, downtown metros to attract visitors, you know, especially uh, cities like ours and Las Vegas, who depend a lot on visitors. So they've had this uh, long-held plan to, to expand down there. Um, what it developed into in recent years was um, first a hotel project. They wanted to build a big hotel at the uh, upriver end. Um, and then they thought, well, we need, um, there's nothing up there, there's a lot of barren acres that we've got, so what we need to do is actually build an entertainment district. So um, they put this out to, to, to bid for various developers, and the winning one is this one that's called River District. Um, they won it um, two and a half years ago, and the uh, uh, plan is to build a whole new neighborhood down there, um, which is supposed to be focused on entertainment type mm -hmm. aspects. Um, and they won on the on the grounds uh, principally that they were going to put in a lot of housing, um, including affordable housing. So the um, what's happening now is just the infrastructure stuff. They're going to improve the roads, tw 26 million project, bring in things like internet and, and that sort of thing to lay the groundwork. Um, the question I think probably for, for New Orleanians is what's this neighborhood going to look like? Mm -hmm. You know, how, How's it going to be in addition to the city? And how's it going to be an entertainment district, which was uh, the original um, plan and still the plan. And uh, for that, there's still some questions up in the air. What, they, what you do know that's going down there is a, uh, an office building, which is going to be the new Shell headquarters. So Shell is moving from their long-standing uh, headquarters at the Hancock building down there. Um, uh, one of the sort of questions on that is it's you know, it's not a it's not a net ad, you know. They're paying more for less space down there, mm -hmm. but that leaves a, a big gap in the middle of the city, and the uh, office market right. in the city is, is not so great. And, um, and according to the developers down there, they've had a lot of interest from some, you know, primo clients, uh, big law firms, that kind of thing, to pay more to move down to this uh, new area's uh, offices, which you know, will, will, will be a drag on the rest of the city's office market. The other thing we know for sure that's going down there is a Top Golf, uh, which is one of these chains that's like entertainment uh, mixed with driving range and, and bars and, and that sort of thing. So, And that's a different one that's going to be at the old, what, the TP, the Times Picayune building site. Yeah, Isn't well, there that's the other one? thing. So away. you have the office, the office, uh, you know, the, the, the office is good, Shell is staying in the city and moving down there, but it's leaving a hole elsewhere. And then the downside of Top Golf, it's been controversial since it was first announced a couple of years ago, um, is that uh, you've got another very similar project mm -hmm. uh, less than three miles away, um, you know, which is going to be a competitor. What uh, about soccer? I mean, soccer is another thing that's been named to go uh, perhaps over there. Is there any interest in pursuing that and, and an entertainment value? venue as well? Yeah, I, I mean, it's the, 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 the USL, uh, um, mm -hmm. it's kind of the farm league. They don't like to be called that, but it's the farm league to uh, Major League Soccer. Um, and they have, um, you know, they've been growing around the, the country in smaller metros. Um, but uh, what they don't want to do is to move to the edge of the city. Those haven't worked where they've tried it. Mm -hmm. The uh, central city locations is what they really want. So they've been really lobbying hard to, to get this plot of land, which is currently a parking lot within this River District development. Um, right next to the Crescent City Connection. But mm -hmm. the uh, uh, Michael Sawaya, who runs the, the convention center and has the say on the matter, um, is not keen on this because uh, soccer didn't work in his previous mm -hmm. job in San Antonio. 
So, um, and then the other the other big question is about what happens to the old Market Street power plant, which right. is not officially part of this development, but the same developers own it and are considering it to be part of it. Um, and what what they're not doing there, which is what uh, everyone thought was going to go in there, is some kind of Live Nation venue. Um, they're talking about something uh, akin to uh, uh, something called Area 15 in Las Vegas, which mm. is sort of gaming, yeah. virtual reality, and all that kind of stuff. So I think the, the big question is, um, you know, how is this going to be an, a, a unique New Orleans neighborhood as opposed to one that could grow up in Las Vegas or Phoenix or something like okay. that? But it is moving forward right now in terms it's of moving housing. moving forward, yeah. They need, they need subsidy for the housing element. So that's going to be determined early next year when um, when the uh, Louisiana Housing Corporation makes a decision mm -hmm. on how much money to give them. But it's going to have to be in stages because they're not going to get enough subsidy for all, all that they propose there. And the other thing is, will the state legislature um, subsidize a, uh, a music heritage um, a museum, which is you know supposed to be our answer to the uh, the, the um, uh, you know um, right. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in okay. Cleveland? All righty, thanks a lot, Tony. Over to you, David. And, you know, you, of course, are an investigative reporter, so you're always coming up with different investigative stories. Yeah. One that you had recently, which I think really is kind of like stunning to people, um, it's a fraud scheme impacting homeowners, just to totally unknowing homeowners. Explain about that. Right. Well, I've spent a lot of time this year looking at fraud that hits homeowners and, and unsuspecting homeowners, as you say. And this was a case where you had people who were getting items in the mail looked like junk mail and it was actually a bill for a loan that purportedly they had taken out on their house to do home improvement. Turns out that none of these folks had taken out an actual loan, that there was a scammer out there, somebody who was going to the uh, lender that was based out in, Cal in California and saying, I'm doing this home improvement work for all of these homes and using false social security numbers, real names and real uh, property addresses to then claim that she had done work. This was a company called Deep South Renovations owned by Samantha McGee who's facing all kinds of problems, other types of financial uh, problems and investigations. In this case, there were about 20 homeowners that I was able to identify who find out that they have a lien on their property for a loan they never took out. Around 20 that you have found out. That, yeah, have, that, that we've been able to confirm through our investigation and then through the lender that they've had to now remove those liens. That's a process that costs the homeowner money and they've never done anything to deserve this or even look into these loans. Uh, it's just, How does this happen? Well, one of the things that I found was that the lenders here, and there's multiple lenders, I've identified two, but the one that was principally involved was this company called Goodleap that specializes in particularly loans for uh, uh, solar panels installation, is that they were not really doing the due diligence that they need. They say they have a robust due diligence process, but because these were false social security numbers and apparently had been attached to these names and addresses for some time to build up some credit, it was passing right through their mm -hmm. review process and they were giving the loans and then they were willing to give the loan proceeds directly to this contractor who wasn't actually doing the work. And so these folks who in the future may want to sell their home, get an actual loan to do mm -hmm. actual work on their properties. And I identify, I interviewed a few of them who were in that situation, wouldn't be able to do so if there was a lien on their property and there had been liens on all of these properties uh, for loans that they would have to pay off in 10 or 15 years. And luckily they've been able, a lot of them have been able to get the liens removed. But it, it's really an insidious thing. And I think it got people- lien is it? It's a lien from the lending company, Goodleap, in this the case. The bank that didn't the do bank, due diligence has exactly. a lien on the... Has a lien on the property mm -hmm. because in their books it says these folks owe, owe us money for work that's already been completed on their house. Not true. I like in one case, solar panels, which obviously were not there if they had done due diligence, easy enough to see. Correct. If but solar panels, panels but this, are there But this contractor <clears throat> who's now had their contractor's license removed Deep South Renovations was claiming in documents, and everything is e-signed. 
you know, automatic signatures. So there's nothing where you have to go to a notary and show that you're really the person signing it. It's all done automatically over the internet. And that's been the basis for a lot of fraud that we've seen over the course of the year. It's just making it easier to do. How do we protect ourselves? Well, in this case, there's uh, places like Jefferson Parish and St. Tammany Parish have a process in place where you can opt in to get notifications whenever something is placed on your property, any kind of document, any kind of deed, lien, other types of things, and you get notified. New Orleans does not have that yet. The Orleans Parish clerk, uh, Chelsea Napoleon, says that that's in the works and they plan to have it uh, launch in January. You would have to opt into that and you'd have to reach out to your clerk's office in your parish I to do that. I was so. going to ask you, how do you do that with right. the parishes that do Well, have you have them. to reach out to the clerk's office as a homeowner. Every homeowner has the opportunity to do that. The other thing that people can do is to freeze their credit. Mm -hmm. We were talking about this before the show that the Office of Motor Vehicles had this terrible data breach across the state of Louisiana. People are being told you really should freeze your credit because mm -hmm. your data is out there. This is another reason to do that. It's just really scary. Okay, another story that you've been working on for quite a while, too. This is regarding a roofing company and a law firm. Right, so this is another one of these examples <coughs> that I was talking about with massive fraud affecting, in this case, thousands of homeowners, people affected by the storms both in western Louisiana with Hurricanes Laura and Delta and then here in eastern Louisiana with Hurricane Ida. Uh, there was a law firm out of Houston called McClenney, Mosley & Associates. They came in and used various methods called schemes by the federal courts to sign up people as their clients without them even knowing And in a lot of cases. In some cases, they would agree to sign on as clients but never hear back from any attorneys and find out later that there had been lawsuits filed against their insurance company by this MMA, McClenney, Mosley & Associates. In eastern Louisiana, they actually, actually appeared to have partnered with a roofing company called Apex Roofing. When I did these stories back in April and May, Apex was avid in saying that they were not aware that this was going on. They had hired MMA as their attorney, and then they thought they were helping homeowners where they went to fix their roofs to say, we'll help you get your insurance money. and we can work through our attorney to do that. What they claimed they didn't know was that then MMA, the attorneys from te Texas, were signing their uh, customers up as clients and then filing lawsuits and negotiating settlements on their behalf, settlements that these folks never saw. And But what I found recently now after interviewing some insiders from Apex Roofing is that these folks who were going out knocking on people's doors saying hire Apex to fix your roof, they were being told, you need to sign these people up with MMA. And some of them were being signed up, auto, again, with automated signatures mm -hmm. on documents that these folks never saw on behalf of them being signed up to be represented by this law firm. And so a homeowner, uh, in many cases, would never see the money. <coughs> to the law firm. Exactly. And I reported uh, uh, about a month ago that there were at least $20 million in insurance checks that were sent to MMA and never deposited, never received by the homeowners. And this is under investigation? This is under federal investigation, and now I've confirmed that the state of Louisiana State Police has mm. started an investigation. Okay, a lot of fraud out there. We really do need to be careful, don't we? Yeah, we need to watch it. Yeah, we definitely and Get it to. out there so that the, the authorities know, because a lot of times they can't keep up with it. You only might have one police officer in a local police force that's dedicated yeah. to fraud and white collar crime and until it gets notified you know put out there on our station or in other yeah. media they might not pick it up so look carefully at that what you may think is junk mail perhaps isn't right? yes yeah. exactly all right thanks a lot david okay tony back on over to you Fulborg brewery we heard recently that it's just not going to do what we thought it was going to do yeah yeah it's a story you don't really want to have to uh... cover it's um... Uh, one where there were big plans to bring, uh, you know, high volume beer brewing back to New Orleans. It was a, a dream of Tom Benson's and carried forward by Gail Benson. She invested 30 million uh, to build this state of the art brewery out in New Orleans East. And um, they rebranded controversially from uh, Dixie to Faubourg. And um, then they partnered uh, last year with these up and coming uh, craft brew guys called Made by the Water. Um, and the idea was that, uh, well, they in fact were bringing all of the production from uh, around the region. They 
uh, controversially closed down one of their breweries up in Morganton, which kind of gutted the city up there. Um, but it was good news for us at the time um, to uh, ramp up production out there from quite a small amount towards the 100,000 barrels a year that, they, that this uh, big facility was capable of. But now, um, they just uh, surprised everyone last week and said, um, we're not going to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, we're outsourcing our, our uh, contract brewing to, you know, a bunch of other states, uh, brewers in other states, while we uh, figure out what what we uh, can do. And then a uh, story that we had today, that we ran today, interviewing the CEO of Made by the Water and uh, a bunch of other people, including city officials, was this has been, for the last eight months, they've been talking to City Hall and and uh, the utilities here about all these problems that they've had, which started with them not being able to find workers uh, to take on a uh, a night shift out there because of safety concerns. Mm -hmm. as, as we know, New Orleans East is one of the uh, higher crime areas, parts of New Orleans East, um, one of the higher crime areas of the city. Um, they had break car break-ins in their own employee lot. Um, they're in dispute with their private security firm because they allegedly were, you know, having beers with their kids, uh, had their, you know, and not doing their jobs. In fact, the private security firm um, admitted um, that they paid for... Uh, for those broken windows on one of the break-ins because their guards hadn't turned up. So, you know, other other big issues they had was they got a half million dollar, $540,000 tax bill, which they, you know, they said, you know, other kind of brewing operations in other parts of the country would, would not have got a, a tax bill like that. Um, so they, they were, the city was trying to negotiate with them to, to, to reduce that, and then they had rolling power outages, which cost them uh, tens of thousands of dollars, and then they had this massive sewage and water bill, which they were talking to the water board, saying that, um, you know, showing them data that comparable brewers in a bunch of other states uh, didn't pay a, a tenth of it, you know, um, and they just could get, they could get nowhere. So it was just too much for them to handle now. So um, yeah. Faubourg, the, the, uh, the draft beer for their brew pub, that will continue to be to be made there at the Faubourg site, right? Yeah, they've got a few different uh, brands that they've that Faubourg does itself. Um, I mean, it's going it's, it's going to be small taproom type mm -hmm. uh, right. brewing. I mean, they've got massive. Um, they they were supposed to be uh, building it out, you know, adding adding to it out there, and now they're just it's going to be like a little um, small operation like you see along uh, Chapatula Street. You know, mm. um, it's not going to be industrial level like the the dream and, and all the jobs of course that go with that right, they, uh, that's a cavernous spot with some real expensive equipment in that building still yeah for sure we, so they don't the, the city says they're not giving up um, and and the Benson organization said there's still there's still a glimmer of hope they hope but um, it's, it seems like it's a done deal now so we'll see what happens okay all right Tony thanks a lot okay Eve, we're gonna go over to you right now for maybe better news some stories to yeah. be thankful for Holy this Thanksgiving Curry, uh, not any rank order or anything just more at whim uh, but just trying to think of some stories from the past year but actually the first one on the list is one that I think you could almost say should be number one uh, and that is here he comes Right away, here, we go. here it comes. Come on, tell us, tell us, Eve. Okay, no hurricanes. Uh, oh, yes. No hurricanes. Definitely. Uh, I think we can all agree with uh, that. No yeah. tropical depression or anything, and so no scare or anything, and so that was really good. Um, another story, I think this is really important, is, is the whole growth in the medical center with uh, with Oxford this year, with getting that uh, work agreement with MD Anderson. That's a huge story, and the whole thing, mm -hmm. also what's going on with the University Hospital, and that's growing, that, that New Orleans, New Orleans a long time ago had a reputation as a health center. Kind of lost it for a while, but I think it's really, um, it's really come back. The next thing, and this ties in what Tony was just talking about, um, the Benson legacy. You know, some people say, well, why did they go out to the East? I think Tom Benson wanted to do something for the East. Um, you know, I think he wanted to see industrial development. Uh, New Orleans is way above its head in terms of the number of pro teams it has, high level. I don't think we would have the basketball team if it weren't for Tom, uh, Tom Benson. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the same ownership as the Saints. I think one of them would have walked by now, but they've really been involved. And just the contributions that, they, um, that they've made around town, it's, uh, I think it's really important. I thought, maybe you all can contradict me on this, I thought the saltwater wedge, I thought the technology was fairly impressive. I thought the people came up with solutions fairly quickly uh, with that kind of wedge thing that they put in and all that, and in Jefferson Parish with the pipes. And so uh, it was so different from, from Katrina where the, uh, uh, where the Corps got fairly criticized, but I thought it seemed kind of impressive to me. And the other thing is the whole sediment diversion project, which started this year, it's been in, in the works for years. And if it goes, it's hope it's going to 
uh, put f fresh soil and, and, and fresh water. It, it's the work like the river used to do, and so that was good. Okay. But you also have the lawsuit now from yeah, there are a know, couple of lawsuits fight it, yeah, fighting fight it, it, it from Plaquemines Ferris against the state to try to get that stopped. Yeah, because there is opposition to it, but uh, the science scientists will back it up saying that this is going to work. Because yeah, yeah, I had a couple more on the list. Do we still have time? Or is it, uh, <laughs> here he comes. Oh. The, uh, <laughs> we have like one Karnak. Uh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> in the whole cruise industry, <laughs> right. okay, we've, 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 we've had cruise boats for a while. What's different is that we're uh, getting those river cruise boats now, uh, notably Viking, which pioneered that. And, and, and like they're all over Europe, uh, yeah. those kind of boats now. And they just give a different experience. They're a more relaxed experience. I think that's the big thing. I think it, it might really help. A lot of the businesses along the okay, river. Okay, we see we're running out of time now, e, so we can just. Um... Okay, so we see the riverfront upgrades, what Tony's yeah. been talking about. Live performance data is when you think with the Thanger and the Orpheum, uh, what we have, and we, you, you know, we have a symphony and we have Broadway type shows, and, right. we, and we have that in the opera. Uh, and... Street Cars Survival, this is the 100th year anniversary of the Pearly Thomas Company that, that makes those green street cars that we see, and we still have them. Uh, I always put Mardi Gras and Jazz Fest because they come in in the middle of the year. By the end of the year, people have forgotten about them, but they have a huge impact. And finally, an honorable mention, the return of Hubie Spies. <laughs> it was actually last November uh, when they returned. This is like the one-year anniversary. And I think most recently they, they reintroduced Coconut. And we even get to see the Ubix Pie Man. Yeah. That, yeah. That's so cute. Save every sign of the Ubix the, the Pie Man. All right, eight uh, other stories. Okay, the next big election that we'll be having will be on March 23rd. Uh, and that's going to be the uh, the primaries for Republican and, and the, the Democratic Party. This one you have to vote by party. It's not like our general mm -hmm. uh, uh, our general elections. And so March 23rd, and then the conventions. By the way, if you want to know, for the uh, for the Democrats, are going to be in Chicago, and for Republicans, are going to be in Milwaukee. All right, David. Let me... I had deja vu this week. We had another oil leak in the Gulf of uh. Mexico, and once again, just like in 2010, they. Numbers coming out from the responsible party were pretty low, like 1% of what it actually was. I was able to get the real number out there on Friday. It was confirmed this week. Uh, we'll see how it goes in terms of getting it the response and keeping that oil from coming into the shore in Plaquemines Parish. Because we don't want to see that happen. That's right. Tony. Oh, we're talking about uh, Governor-elect Landry coming in. He signaled with his appointment to the top environmental job that um, that he's going to be more, um, you know, in favor of uh, the economy than, um, as he put it, than, uh, than uh, you know, clean green policies. But we've got a story coming out that, you know, that's that's really behind the curve of what companies are doing these days. Entergy is uh, sold off uh, part of its gas business recently, and it's investing. It's scrambling to catch up, in fact, hmm. with solar investments because its clients, big industry, um, are going green no matter what the local policies will be. It's, it's the way things are going. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you all for joining us. Hope you have a nice weekend, and we'll see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. This program is brought to you in part by the Eugenie and Joseph Jones Family Foundation, a local foundation proud to support education, the arts, and culture in the greater New Orleans area.